Hello and welcome back to Spider-Man Dissembled. This is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Jason Freston. Welcome back, everyone! Woo! So let's talk about Amazing Spider-Man 562 to 563 by Bob Gale and Mike McCone. So McCone, for me, his stuff feels like a real departure from the last artist, but McCone's good, and he always tries for a dynamic shot, I think. He's, he's a good artist. He's not one of my favorites, but I, I think he's really talented. Yeah, I really like McCone too, like 99% of the time. One of the reasons why he's really good with facial expressions, and that kind of reminds me of Kevin McGuire, whose work on the Justice League stuff is just amazing. But for some reason, I don't know exactly why, but for some reason, McCone's art here just doesn't quite mesh with the way that I kind of usually associate, specifically Peter, like Spider-Man's fine, but something's just off about Peter's face and a few other people. I don't know, it's kind of weird. I mean, I don't dis like it at all. It's just kind of off. Starting us off again, Bob Gale has a cover with Spidey unmasking. I don't know what... I don't even know... It, it might not even be Gale who's harping on this. I mean, he might have nothing to do with the covers, but he did do, like, page one or two or whatever uh, in that fourth part of that Freak storyline. He just... He really seems to like focusing on or harping on or talking about Spidey unmasking, except in any real way. So Peter is now officially blacklisted by the DB, he can't find work anywhere. Again, this is another Peter looking for work scene that kind of makes him look stupid. My immediate question is, why isn't he going to Frontline, run by Ben Urich, who he used to work with and who really likes Peter? Not only does it really make Peter look kind of stupid for not being able to find work, it actually like looks kind of bad on every other magazine agency in New York that Bennett can blacklist him entirely. You know, I mean, especially when, when this is a man that it seems like everybody kind of despises is in the sense that they know he's insane, you know? They know that he forgets the names of his workers, but never forgets the names of his enemies. You know, it just seems like this is the type of guy that they'd be like, look, we're a small paper, what, whatever. I mean, we don't care. What's he gonna do to us? So it just seems kind of odd that there is, like, first, that Pete's not going to front line right off the bat. You would think that would be the first thing he goes to. But lacking that, it just seems like there's this monolithic, organized, like, nobody will hire you because of Bennett, which really leaves the only option as Frontline, which makes it more ridiculous he hasn't gone there yet. I don't know. It's odd. Even Betty thinks Spidey is the Spidey Tracer killer, and she mentions Civil War, so Peter must not have unmasked? I guess he didn't? This is all very confusing at this point. I, I, I like the mystery, but maybe something a little more concrete would be helpful. To kind of elaborate on something that I was talking about earlier that I don't think I conveyed very well when I was saying I don't think they want you to remember that he unmasked, I, I guess what I'm really trying to get at is they're just kind of glossing over it. They're trying to, and, I, and I've said this before also, they're kind of trying to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be like, yeah, 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 no, 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 just because Mephisto works his mojo or his mofisto Joe doesn't mean that all of this other crap hasn't happened. And civil war happened, you know, and they're trying to let you know that, but at the same time, they're trying to hedge their bets and be like, no, 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 you know, we're not going to talk about the unmasking, and we're just going to gloss over that, because, frankly, I honestly don't think they have an idea of how to deal with it at this point. I really don't. So I really don't think there's a mystery here. I don't think they're trying to set up clues, or at least not intentionally. The basher calls Spidey out to a duel, or does he? The bookie takes bets on the results. Holy text bubbles. Okay, like, seriously, this book, I mean, is wall-to-wall -wall text bubbles, which I don't mind. Kind of actually kind of gives it an old-school feel. One thing that a lot of comics in the most recent decades have done have been a little bit more streamlined and try to convey things in fewer words, which I, I don't, I, I'm not necessarily against that by any means. I just don't necessarily think that's the only way to go. This book definitely swings the other direction. I mean, there's not a lot of real estate that is not used during the course of the story where there is not some massive wordage going on. <laughs> As a little side note, three of the first seven pages are splash pages. Jesus. This is an overuse of splash pages. This easily could have been one issue. Or it could have been two issues with a lot more subplots. We get a lot of the bookie and his mongoloid mother and cancer-ridden father. It's not pretty or funny or interesting, but at least Gail is trying for some character stuff here. Yeah, the scene with the bookie and his parents, kind of weird. I mean, it's it's like this is the darker side of married with children or something, but it, it goes on for like a good two or three pages. I guess one of the things that I'm a little bit, I don't know if frustrated would be the right word for it, but there's been more time spent on the relationship right now between the bookie and his family and 
his parents than there has been with Peter and any of his friends that's really not Harry. And I mean, I'm almost willing to bet Harry on this one, too. I think if we were to splice all of the, you know, probably not literally all of the panels together, I'm sure there'd be more, but just the amount of information and the amount of understanding of the relationship between each of these characters together, we now technically, I really feel, have more understanding of the bookie and his parents' relationship and how they feel about each other and just di their dynamic than we do about Peter and Carly or Peter. Peter and even Betty, you know, I mean, we're really relying on our knowledge of Betty prior to One More Day for us older readers to, to carry us through on that. If you're a brand new reader, you don't know Jack about her. It's almost the same thing with Peter and Harry, you know, and Peter and, and Lily. So that's kind of, you know, I wish they would do a scene like that with Peter and somebody that's not Aunt May, you know, I mean, that would just be nice. I, I would like that. Also, a couple of casts ago, I mentioned, you know, editorial jokes and, and how that one issue was starting to push it, but it wasn't too bad. All right, this issue, bad. All of these little editor things popping up all over the place really are getting frustrating and boring and not funny at all. I mean, at all. And it, they're starting to kind of drive me crazy in this issue. Yeah, just, I'm throwing that out there. So Spidey fights Basher and wins, but... One, the basher isn't real. Bookie made him up. This is all just a setup. Oh, and one more thing. Going back to the scene with Peter and Vic at the apartment where Vic's like, you know, hey, this might be a good place for you to get some pictures of Spider-Man since I noticed you haven't been doing it lately. Okay, so I'm really starting to not like Vic for a number of reasons. Almost starting not to like the New York PD, but that's all right because it really just consists of Vic and two other people. But specifically because Pete's like, well, you know, are you going to go up there and cover this? And Vic's like, I don't know if you think Spider-Man would validate date this loser? And I'm like, okay, you know what? Vic may have a point. Maybe they don't believe Spider-Man would validate a loser like this. But it's still a super villain that's threatening to fight people. Aren't they worried that maybe, perhaps, if he's up there yelling for Spider-Man and Spidey doesn't show up, that perhaps, you know, he Basher might just get upset and start ripping things apart? And maybe the police should be keeping an eye on this just in case. An adjacent thought to this, you know, there is the superhero initiative going on. This is a a man that supposedly has superpowers or at the very least is dressed up in a costume, you know, and is out there calling out Spider-Man saying, I will be here at X time on X day at X location ready to beat you down. Why at that moment is not the initiative or, you know, the Thunderbolts or somebody just bearing down on his butt and just dragging him off, you know, in cuffs before Spidey can even show up or waiting for Spidey to show up to descend on both of them at the same time. I mean, it, uh, it's just kind of a weakness over all on this this entire concept for this story because again even even bookie you know you think the bookie would have thought about this like oh i got this great idea oh wait the initiative will just you know like bend me over or not bend me over because they won't know i'm doing it but they're just totally come in and ruin this whole plan so it just the whole thing's just kind of on shaky ground and and i guess i don't know it just, it just rubs me the wrong way a little bit. And two, it's not Peter Parker, it's Screwball. I love how the moment that we find out Screwball is posing as Spider-Man, all of a sudden she grows breasts. Like, if you look back at the previous panels of her bouncing around Spider-Man, no bumpage. The moment you see her unmasked, yep, there's, a, there's some definite, yeah, you know, yeah. There you go. I guess she was just holding it in all that time. Screwball has a line, There's no law against putting on a costume and making a spectacle of yourself. I would imagine the Superhero Registration Act people might disagree. Spidey in the bar with no name. OMG! When Spidey's in the bar with no name um, at the beginning of the second part, there there's an in-joke, the type that I like, not these kind of crazy editorial pop-up ones, but um, in the bar where he's like, sorry, pal, that's not my brand. The guy's coming at him with a glass that says Brand Eck, which obviously is an in-joke back for the Not Brand X series, like in the 60s sometime, and also they talked about, they, they used that gag a lot in the old What The books. So um, uh, I... I Definitely prefer subtle little things like that over the, you know, bouncing baby Joe Quesada says smoking's bad, kids. Wah, wah, wah. Okay, a really random subplot here. There are miracle cures happening at Feast. Feast. Yeah, that's just in there. The big climax here is Spidey and the bookie's dad versus the enforcers at an amusement park. So that happens. And we find out the bookie's dad is trying to make money off the fight. I think the subtext here of what this entire two-part storyline is about is A, betting is bad, and B, smoking is bad. I think both of those were driven home quite soundly during it. 
kind of a dark note here, but Spidey hanging the bookie's dad from the scaffolding reminds me of the end of House of M Spider-Man. So a little hint for the subplots, the bookie knows that the Spidey tracer killings are a purposeful setup, but by whom? The bookie's dad's money that he wins from the bets turns into a $16,000 contribution to FEAST! I also like how Peter calls Aunt May and is like, did somebody make a sizable donation this morning? And she's like, well, yes, how did you know that? And he's like, I made a bet with somebody. Where she's like, really? Aren't you poor and jobless? How are you making bets like that? You know, that somebody would have $16,000 dropped off at feast. I, I don't know. I just, basically, I, I guess I'm just annoyed that the ending of that issue didn't just have a sad trombone. Wah, wah, wah. Overall, my reaction here is meh. I mean, uh, at this point, I think the books are $3 a piece. So people just spent $6 and two weeks on this. Woo? I don't know. I, I don't really see a reason why this needed to be two parts, but if, uh, you know, I didn't hate it, I guess. It was just yay. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just, I don't have anything more to say about this story than that. It just was really unimpressive. A couple of minor subplots got advanced minusculely. Whatever. Not bad. I mean, I wasn't offended, just... Why bother? Yeah, overall, wasn't too wasn't too enthused with this uh, story arc either. You know, like Michael said, it's not offensive. I, there there seems to be some pretty big logic gaps in it, but you know, I mean, a lot of comics do when you kind of like really really look at them, and I I don't mind that. I kind of roll with it. I oddly enough actually think writing wise and entertainment value. I don't know. I guess I guess technically this was actually more entertaining than Gail's last story arc he did with Freak. It seemed a little less forced. I, I guess maybe. Maybe he writes bad betting dialogue better than he writes bad junkie dialogue. And, I mean, and a lot of the things about the story that irritated me were, like, editor's notes, which I honestly have no idea if those are Gales, if they are actually the writers, or if they are actually the editors doing it. I'm not sure which way that goes, but that kind of really ended up annoying me a lot. Let's go ahead and talk about Amazing Spider-Man 564, Three-Way Collision. This is by Bob Gale, Mark Guggenheim, and Dan Slott, with art by Paolo Siqueira. So, uh, this is kind of Rashomon. Kind of. Uh, though not really. It's not one story seen from three perspectives. It's one story seen from three perspectives, and each perspective continues where the last one left off and adds a little bit. It's not just one event three times. It's three events three times, I guess. Or, or one event seen in three pieces from three different points of view. The points of view that we see are Spidey, Vin, Overdrive, and Dexter Bennett, kind of, at the end. So essentially we have four. It's mostly three, though. We get Spidey versus Overdrive in here again. All of the people who are our narrators lie in cutesy, amusing ways, which makes me want to throw up. Yeah, the narrator's lying thing. Oh, that, I'm just really more and more disliking Vic. Like, you know, Overdrive you expect. He's a bad guy, and, you know, Mr. Negative could kill him, so I expect him to kind of put a spin on things, you know, or at least try to either make himself look better or whatnot. Then, on the other hand, basically beginning to end just kind of comes off as a jerk. There's really nothing that he does here that gives him any type of sympathetic characterization. Even the part you should be. I mean, you're. it's understandable why Vin is upset at Peter for this. It totally is understandable, but the way he handles it makes him come off as a prick. And then everything else he does throughout the rest of his narration just reinforces that image. I believe the reader isn't supposed to be fully supportive of Vin because, you know, Vin, he doesn't like Spider-Man, and the reader should like Spider-Man, so just having Vin not like Spider-Man I think is supposed to at least add a level of antagonism between the reader and Vin, but, you know, uh, J. Jonah Jameson doesn't like Spider-Man, and he still yet turns out to be a sympathetic character, at least sometimes. Vin has no redeeming qualities that I have seen throughout the course of any of his appearances so far, and that really frustrates me, because I really, really want to be liking the new supporting cast members. That's what they're there for, and again, so far, they've just been kind of failing more or less across the board. We find out that Mr. Negative has a Detective Willoughby working for him on the police force, or he did anyway. Overdrive apparently has Transformers-style nanite powers. It kind of reminds me of that thing at the end of the first Transformers movie that made, like, Xboxes start attacking people, stuff like that. Michael Bay should totally be making an Overdrive movie, and instead of Overdrive being a human, because that wouldn't make sense, he should make Overdrive an alien.
and that will be great. I'm, I'm fully supportive of this idea. Go, Michael Bay. Go. I won't even charge you for it. I gotta say, I don't know Paolo Siqueira, but I really like this art. Peter looks off, but everyone else looks great, and the layouts are fun. It always feels like we're in motion here, which I like. Yeah, I'm really digging Apollo's pencils as well overall. I, I totally love his layouts. Like you said, his action shots. Some of them are really kind of reminiscent of like 90s era Spider-Man when McFarlane didn't quite suck. In some places, I feel like the inking might be a little bit too thick, but it doesn't distract at all. It's And I mean, I may be wrong. I'm not even an artist, so I, I maybe I'm just being like, you know, hypersensitive and like intentionally trying to find flaws in his art. But overall, I really really dig it, and I hope he does more work for him. Much like the bookie storyline, this story is very meh. I mean, I don't feel anything great about it, I don't feel anything horrible about it, but it's like, again, we get a couple of subplots advanced a tiny little bit, and it's just a one-parter. I guess the two-parters are okay, at least they're not three-parters when nothing happens, <laughs> but I, I would much prefer a little one-off one-shot like this than a two-parter even. Uh, especially a three-parter. Yeah, totally happy that this was just a one-issue story arc, you know, a done-in-one. I'm glad they didn't try to drag this out. The story totally could not have been drug out to, well, let's rephrase that. The story definitely should not have been drug out to two or more issues, and I'm glad they, they understood that and didn't do it. I'm not overly enthused with the story at all. I didn't think it sucked. I actually guess I technically liked it better than the bookie storyline, but it might have been partially because this scene felt tighter since it was in one issue. The sad thing is, you know, I was like, I just didn't like Vin, and that was a third of the book, and... Ah, you know, he's the one guy out of all of this. I'm like, oh, I just don't want to hear about him. He sucks. It just feels like, I, I mean, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But it feels like right now where we are with everything, we have so many mysteries spinning out there that it's just not time to, like, hang back and have a wacky Spidey versus the Enforcers two-parter. If we didn't have so many mysteries hanging up in the air, I think these would feel more acceptable. Yeah, I guess one of the big deals with this, having these three issues right now, is this was a filler month, and it really shows. I, I don't know if they needed more time to kind of line up some ducks in a row to be able to move on to the next part of the storyline, if maybe they had writers or artists that weren't done with what needed to be that was upcoming, or if they just planned on kind of having a scheduled filler month, but this was a month of filler books, and I would assume that reading this on the newsstands, <laughs> the newsstands, that this would probably be kind of a frustrating experience. I, I understand the concept of needing to have a filler issues. I mean, it happens in the comics industry, that's fine. I think since they're doing it three times a month, though, they should have spaced them out a little bit more. You know, it should have been maybe, I, first off the bat, I don't think there should have been a two-part filler one. If you're going to be doing a two-part, those two parts should have something pertinent going on. Aside from that, I think they should have spread spread these out. You know, it's like at the beginning of one month, it's a filler issue. The next two issues are part of the storyline of that finish off that month. The first issue of the next month is the third part of that storyline finishes it off. The second issue of that month is another filler issue, one shot done in one. And then if you know, and then you just kind of snowball like that. So the next time you've got like a five parter and then you've got a one, you know, issue filler, maybe if they're pressed do two filler issues, but they really should be nice, tight, fun stories, organic, fun stories, not forced fun stories. And I think that's probably why I technically like this Overdrive one a little bit more, is it felt more organic. You know, like the humor in it wasn't as forced as I felt, like editorially forced with those little bubbles and whatnot, like I felt happened in the bookie storyline. On the other hand, the stuff that I seem to enjoy the most are the kind of forget the mysteries, just have fun with Spidey swinging around and doing stuff with bad guys. So I'm torn on this. I honestly think we could use more of the mystery resolving stuff, and not necessarily saying something as big as Omit, just throwing us out some more clues. It feels to me like something like Zeb Wells' three-parter with Wolverine and the Snow Demons, etc., etc., worked really, really well as a kind of one-off that meant nothing to the overall plot, because it worked as a Spider-Man story. This stuff is okay as a Spider-Man story, but it misses that one main ingredient of being interesting, or something that I really care about reading. But again, I want to repeat, nothing offensively bad, so hey, hang it in there. That's really all I have to say on the matter. This is Michael T. Bradley. And I'm Jason Freston. Thank you very much for joining us. Spider-Man Dissembled.